be to God. I want to let you know uh, that last night the Duke men's basketball team beat the UNC men's basketball team. Um, yeah, that's appropriate to clap for. Yeah. Not related to the sermon at all. I just thought you should know that. Um, however, it, it did remind me of something. Um, so I, I have this um, friend. I, I know a guy. Maybe you know a guy, right? Or you know a guy who knows a guy. I know a guy. Uh, and this guy has an unbelievable ability to make connections, right? So he, he, I know this guy, and he knows another guy, and somehow he can make any connection happen you want to make happen. Uh, and so uh, I know a guy, and, and this guy said, hey, Jim, I know you're a big Duke fan. Um, have you ever uh, met Coach K or gotten to know him at all or whatever? And I said, no. I mean, I, I I'm shocked by this, but no, Coach K doesn't know who I am or anything like that. He said, okay, okay, that's cool. So a few weeks later, he calls me. He says, let's go out to lunch. I say, okay. We get together, and he's got, I got a couple gifts for you, Jim. What, well, uh, all right. I don't know what the occasion is, but sure, that's great. What do you got? So uh, I, uh, first, he gave me a book. It's a book by Coach K called um, Leading With Your Heart, and it's signed by Coach K. It just has his name on the inside. That was kind of cool. And then I had this big box um, with this basketball in it. Uh, and on the basketball, it says, to Pastor Gates, go Duke, Mike Krzyzewski, which is pretty awesome, right? Uh, I'm also, I really appreciate the fact that even Coach K can't spell his own last name. Um, <laughs> this is really a neat gift. I mean, it was a lot of thought and effort that went into this. Um, but, but it just strikes me, it's amazing. I mean, if you, if you know the right people, right, what you can get done. I, I know a guy who knows a guy who knows Coach K, right? I mean, how cool is that? Uh, and, and I've been thinking about that because this particular story um, is really a story about knowing a guy. Uh, Abraham knows a guy, right? I mean, Abraham in this story ends up in this really fascinating, weird conversation with God, um, trying to get God to do what He wants God to do. Um, but even more interestingly, you notice that in this story, God says, I know a guy. It's really a weird moment, um, but Abraham and Sarah have this, this strange interaction where God says, you're going to have a baby, and they don't believe Him, and they laugh. And, um, and then the men leave, the, the men meaning the angels, leave, and Abraham and one of the men, God, uh, Yahweh, are left behind. And, and Yahweh says, verse 17, Yahweh said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, seeing that Abraham shall become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. No, for I have chosen him that he may charge his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. L literally, God says, um, I've got this problem about Sodom and Gomorrah, and I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to do yet, but I know a guy named Abraham, and I'm going to talk to Abraham about my problem. It's a weird moment, right? We don't usually think about God um, needing a guy and going in and, and, and wanting someone else to help with his situation. But in this moment, God says, no, I need Abraham's advice. Um, I want Abraham to be involved in this situation. Uh, and we get this idea, we've talked about this before, uh, that God wants us to be partners, right? That God wants us to be partners. That's what a covenant is all about, about being a partner with God. Uh, and, and here we get this idea that not only is God going to be involved in helping Abraham with his problems, God wants Abraham to get involved in helping with God's problems. Uh, and the central problem that God has in the whole story of Scripture is how can He redeem the, the children that He's made and loved from the sins that they're committing, right? How, how can He rescue us from our sin without pretending like that sin doesn't matter? God wants to be merciful, but He can't be unjust. Uh, and so, um, He's going to get Abraham involved. Noah was involved. Noah offered a sacrifice. That helped. Now, Abraham's going to do more than that. Abraham is going to offer intercession. So Abraham steps up and he starts negotiating with God. 
Uh, I heard a story this week about a negotiation between a group of union members and their employer that was at an impasse. And in this negotiation, the um, main issue at stake was whether or not the members of this union were flagrantly abusing their contract's sick leave, right? There were all kinds of rules about sick leave, and, and the company was saying they were abusing those rules. And so one morning at the bargaining table, the company's chief negotiator pulls out the morning edition of the newspaper, and he holds it up. And he says, this man called in sick yesterday, and on the cover of the sports page is the employee in question uh, who was supposedly ill and had just won a local golf tournament that the previous day with an excellent score. And so the room is silent for a minute, and then a union negotiator speaks up, and he says, wow, just think of what kind of score he would have had if he hadn't been sick. <laughs> this negotiation uh, that Abraham has with God is almost as ridiculous as that negotiation. Uh, Abraham comes to God and he says, God, you're not going to wipe away the righteous with the wicked, are you? Uh, and this is a wild, crazy, stupid thing to say. First of all, so far in our story, we've had two people who've been named righteous, Noah and Abraham, right? In the whole Bible, two people, Noah and Abraham, and between us, Abraham kind of gets in on the cheap, right? I mean, he's reckoned as righteous. He's not really a righteous guy. Um, His faith gets him counted as righteous. Uh, In the whole of human history, we've had two people that are righteous, and he says, well, wait a minute. What if there's a bunch of righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah? You're not going to kill them too, right? Uh, And then he says, oh, God, I mean, you're the judge of all the earth. You've got to be fair, right? I mean, you've got to act justly. Again, uh, Abraham, who sold his wife to Pharaoh, Abraham, who slept with his wife's maidservant, and then was like, hey, babe, it's your problem. You deal with it. Abraham is concerned that God might not be fair. But in this bizarre negotiation, God does two things that are really striking, uh, th- several things that are really striking. Uh, the first thing is God responds to Abraham as though he has credibility. Right? He responds to Abraham as though he really is a righteous person who deserves to be in conversation with God. He doesn't laugh him off or say, what are you talking about or what are you doing here? He, he, he actually engages thoughtfully and honestly with Abraham's request. Uh, And then the other thing that's really interesting is is God kind of waits around for Abraham to start talking. I mean, literally, some of the angels go off to do their thing, and one person stays behind and waits to see what Abraham will say about it. God is literally waiting to be asked about this whole weird situation that He's facing. So, Abraham starts talking to God, and he says, hey, what if there's 50 righteous people in the city? And you're not going to destroy the whole city for 50 righteous people, right? That wouldn't be fair. And, and God makes a bizarre response. I mean, this whole story is just crazy. God says, no, for 50 righteous people, I'll spare the city. That's not the response I would expect God to say. I expect God to say, oh no, if there's 50 righteous people, I'll spare the 50 righteous people and I'll just kill the wicked people, right? But He didn't say that. And I'll spare everybody. I'll spare the righteous and I'll spare the wicked if there's just enough righteous people around. Uh, by the way, um, this is a theme that we're going to find throughout Scripture. Uh, it began with Noah, who was righteous, and through his righteousness saved his family that was not righteous, um, that some people that are living their lives in proper relationship with God not only can be reconciled to God themselves, but can be vessels through whom others are reconciled to God. Uh, so, God says, all right, Abraham, sure, uh, 50 people. And Abraham says, all right, well, what if five people are missing? And they go down this this bizarre conversation until we get all the way down to 10. And Abraham says, okay, 10 people. And God says, all right, if there's 10 people, I'll spare the whole city. Now, uh, in this conversation, um, I think we can read this story in two ways. We can read it as just a series of conversations, a series of questions where God already has His mind made up. Or we can read this as a story where God and Abraham are making up their minds together. 
And I think it's the latter that's intended. I think we're intended to believe that in this conversation, in this back and forth between Abraham and Yahweh, they are making up their mind together about this problem that God is facing. How many righteous people does it take to save a city? It's significant that this is not a conversation where God is asking, I'm sorry, where Abraham is asking God to do stuff that's outside of his character. Abraham isn't saying, hey God, I've got a list of 50 really annoying people I'd like you to smite. Uh, And God says, what about 45? And it's not that kind of conversation. Um, In fact, Abraham is asking God to live into that aspect of God's character that Abraham has the most experience with, God's mercy. God says, hey, I've got to be just, but I want to be merciful. And Abraham says, all right, let's just focus on that mercy. Let's just live into that character of, of that quality of your character that I know the best. Uh, and in so doing, um, Abraham is this in-between figure between the whole city of Sodom and Yahweh. And we get this idea that one person in the story of Scripture can stand in the gap for another, um, for a city of others, ultimately for a world of others. Uh, this, this work that Abraham does of negotiating with God, of, of praying to God, is the work that we're going to see done by Moses Uh, and by Nehemiah and everybody in between. It's this idea that one righteous person can inspire God to choose mercy for those who are not even deserving of mercy, that God is just waiting to be asked, and that somehow this is the job of God's partners. This is our job. And of course, ultimately, all of those people are foreshadowing Jesus, right? Jesus is the one who stands on a hill and overlooks a city um, under or on a tree and intercedes for the world. That's what we're told in Romans 8.34, that even now, Jesus intercedes for us. Even now, uh, as God looks down upon every one of us, Jesus is sitting at God's right hand and saying, ah, yeah, I know about, I know about what Jim said last week, and I know um, how he hurt that person's feelings, but, but, but Father, let me tell you, um, I think we should be merciful to Jim. And, and the amazing part of the story is not that Jesus does that, because we kind of expect Jesus to be the one who intercedes for us with God. It's that we who are reckoned as righteous by our faith are expected to also be people who cooperate with God, who make a way for God to act through our prayers. One of my um, favorite stories about um, interceding for other people in prayer actually comes from a book by John Ortberg called The Life You've Always Wanted. Uh, And in it, he he tells the story actually of another guy named Tony Campolo. Uh, In the story, Tony is at a Pentecostal college, and he's going to speak at a chapel service. Uh, And before the chapel service, a group of eight people who are leaders in the college say, hey, um, Mr. Campolo, we want to pray for you before you speak. He says, great, I love prayer. So they go into a back room in the chapel, and he kneels down, and all eight guys lay their hands on his head and start praying. And he says, now that's a really sweet thing, except that they go kind of long with their prayers, right? Uh, And so he's on his knees, which is not comfortable. And what happens when eight men with their hands on your head start getting tired? Well, they start leaning on your head, right? And so Tony says at some point he feels like he's literally holding them up um, as they keep praying and praying for him. Uh, And to make matters worse, one of the guys wasn't even praying for Tony. Uh, He kept going on and on about somebody named Charlie Stolzfus. Uh, Oh, Lord, you know Charlie Stolzfus. Oh, Lord, he lives in that silver trailer just down the mile, a mile on the road uh, from from this college. You know the trailer, Lord, just down a mile on the road on the right-hand side. And and he wanted to say, guys, you don't have to give God directions, right? He's, uh, and this guy keeps going, Lord, Charlie told me this morning he's going to leave his wife and three kids. Step in and do something, God. Bring that family back together. 
Tony says uh, he finally got the Pentecostal preachers off his head and got off the ground, delivered his message, and the chapel service got in the car and started driving home. <clears throat> and on the way home, uh, he got, just got onto the Pennsylvania Turnpike, and he saw a hitchhiker, and so he stopped and picked him up. And by the way, let's pause our story for a minute and say, please, in general, do not stop and pick up hitchhikers, okay? All right. Anyway, Tony stops and picks up a hitchhiker, and they're driving down the road introducing themselves. And he says, hi, I'm, I'm Tony Campolo. And the other guy says, oh, hi, uh, my name is Charlie Stolzfus. <laughs> and Tony says uh, he couldn't believe it. And I'm actually going to read the rest of this from Tony's perspective. Um, Tony says, I got off the turnpike at the next exit and headed back. My passenger got a bit uneasy with that. And after a few minutes, he said, hey, mister, where are you taking me? I said, I'm taking you home. He narrowed his eyes and asked, why? I said, because you just left your wife and three kids, right? That blew him away. Yeah, that's right. With shock written all over his face, he plastered himself against the car door and never took his eyes off of me. Then I really did him in as I drove right to his silver trailer. <laughs> when I pulled up, his eyes seemed to bulge as he asked, how did you know that I lived here? I said, God told me. And I believe God did tell me. When he opened the trailer door, his wife exclaimed, you're back, you're back. He whispered in her ear, and the more he talked, the bigger her eyes got. Then I said with real authority, the two of you sit down. I'm going to talk, and you two are going to listen. And man, did they listen. That afternoon, I led those two people to Jesus Christ. What Abraham never considers in his prayer conversation with God, what that Pentecostal head-leaning-on preacher never considered in his prayer that was kind of for Tony and kind of not, was that God wouldn't listen or that prayer doesn't matter. The danger for us is not that we're going to pray and it's not going to be effective. The danger for us is not uh, that prayer doesn't really work because we can't change the mind of God. The danger for us is not uh, that God won't listen to me because I'm not a good enough person for God to want to listen to me. The danger for us is really simple. It's that we will abdicate our responsibility to pray. It's that God who wants us to be His partners in redeeming the world, God who waits for us to show up and speak up, negotiate with Him on behalf of others, um, that God is waiting for us and we might not speak up. When we do speak up, we get unbelievable help. Right? Paul talks about this in Romans. Paul says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for when we do not know how to pray as we ought, that very Spirit intercedes with groanings too deep for words. And God who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. In other words, when you are in prayer for somebody else, when you are asking God to show them the mercy that He has shown you because it is in keeping with His character and His desire and His will, you can't say the wrong words. You can't mess up the prayer. If you do, God will make the prayer work anyway. He so desperately wants partners who will advocate for grace and mercy in the world with Him uh, that the Spirit will give you the words. The Spirit will be a guy that helps you be the guy that they need with God. We're going to hear next week a little bit about what happens with Abraham's prayer, but let me just give away the ending now. Without this prayer, Lot and his wife and his two daughters would not be saved. Without your prayer, what might not happen? By the way, um, this kind of prayer, this, this 
intermediary kind of prayer, this intercessory prayer, is not one that always nets results immediately. Uh, Tony's experience was incredible, but I do not want to suggest that every time you ask God to do something incredible, He's going to immediately do it. In fact, that doesn't even happen with Abraham, right? In this story, Abraham has this long back and forth conversation with God. This is on purpose. Your prayers are going to be a lot like Abraham's prayers. There'll be times when you ask for something and God says no. There'll be times when you ask for something and you feel like God remains silent. There'll be times where you ask for something something, uh, and God gives a little bit, and you have to keep asking and keep asking and keep asking. Uh, in those moments, I'm often reminded of the parable of the unjust judge that Jesus gives to His disciples. He says there was a widow coming to a judge who was unfair and unjust, uh, but she keeps coming to Him over and over again until she finally wears Him out. That's how we're supposed to pray God's mercy in people's lives, over and over and over again until we wear Him out. I'm going to tell you a story about um, one of my favorite um, wear them out prayer warriors. His name was Jim. Everybody's name is Jim. His name was Jim, Jim White, uh, a member of my former church, the church where I grew up in. Uh, Jim was an uh, incredible servant and super active in the church. And we had a, a contemporary worship service, kind of like our service here on Sunday nights. And like here on Sunday nights, during that service, we would stop and give people the opportunity to, to out loud share prayer requests. How can we be in prayer for you when people would share things? And Jim White, every single Sunday, would say, I want prayers for Trailer and Landon. I want prayers for Trailer and Landon. Every single Sunday, he got up and he prayed for Trailer and Landon. Trailer and Landon were his two children, uh, and I knew them a little bit because uh, I was a youth leader, and then I was the pastor there, and so I knew their story, and I kind of knew how they had um, grown up in the church, fallen away from faith, had some struggles, come back, wandered away again. But every single, every single Sunday for I don't know how many years, Jim White would say, I want to pray for Trailer and Landon. Actually, it became almost a joke in the church. People would come to our new member classes, and we'd do like three, four hours of introductions about the church, and at the end we'd say, hey, what questions do you have that we haven't answered yet? And no kidding, I can't tell you how many times people would say, hey, who are Trailer and Landon, right? Because we're praying for them every week. In November, uh, I'm sorry, in October of last year, uh, Jim's wife, Martha, passed away, and he had been caring for her um, for an unbelievable amount of time and just showed incredible devotion to his wife in the final stages of her earthly life. Uh, and then uh, six weeks after she died, Jim died. Uh, yesterday was the funeral, and I was able to watch that funeral online, um, and um, I was able to see Trailer and Landon sitting in the front row of the sanctuary of the church where they came to know Christ and where their father prayed them through every crisis in their life and where that family uh, of faith came together to pray them through every crisis in their life. And I knew not only did they have a saving faith in Jesus Christ now, uh, but that uh, this crisis would be one they could overcome because they had a family of faith that would be continuing the work of Jim White um, and praying for them every day. That's what God calls us to do. God calls us to partner with Him in prayer. He equips us to the power of the Holy Spirit so we can't get it wrong. He calls us to be persistent, and He reminds you that even now, at this very moment, there is a righteous man seated at the right hand of the throne of God, constantly interceding for you. We all know a guy who knows a guy, but you're the guy, you're the gal that knows the guy. They know you and you know him, and he has called you to be the guy, be the gal, be the intermediary, be the intercessor for somebody in your life that God wants to be merciful to if only you will negotiate with Him. Be the guy who knows the guy. Thanks be to God. Amen.